Uh, okay, hi. Um, so the first question is, why did Postgres decide to add a JSON data type? Uh, the answer is simple, because of NoSQL. But what is NoSQL? Um, NoSQL, the simplest way to explain what NoSQL is, is to look at the history of it. Uh, sometime in the 80s, um, the relational databases became the next big thing. And everybody was wondering, is this going to be any good? Just like everybody's wondering now about the NoSQL databases. And it turned out that relational databases are pretty awesome. Uh, they gave us um, normalized data, which meant no duplicates and simple changing of data. They gave us SQL, uh, which became a sort of a uh, standard for querying uh, relational databases. Uh, and they, they even gave us asset compliant transactions which is a fancy word for saying that uh, the database promises it will never, ever, absolutely never lose any of your data. Um, but, there was, but the problem is that most programming, on the other hand, is object-oriented. So um, when, while in code, you represent data as objects, as classes, but to save the data to the database, you need to separate it into bits and pieces to store it, to store it in a table-like structure. And this is a problem that's prominent enough that it has its own name. It's called impedance mismatch. A solution to this problem, um, object uh, databases, has been uh, presented already in the 90s, but it never got mainstream because relational databases are pretty nice, pretty awesome. Uh, what did change with time was that um, suddenly you had lots of data. Suddenly you had these huge uh, companies like Google and Amazon, and they had enormous amounts of data, uh, too big to be stored um, on a single server. And there's the catch. SQL was never meant to be run on clusters of in interconnected servers. It was always meant to be, ru be run on a single system. And that is where NoSQL comes into uh, the picture. Um, because one of the design features of most of NoSQL databases is that it can be run on a cluster of uh, interconnected uh, machines uh, that are cheap and that, are, uh, and that it's highly distributable. Now, another interesting feature of the, JSON, of the NoSQL uh, databases is that, it, that they are schema agnostic. And this has two um, very interesting um, consequences. The first one being that you can start using your database as soon as you set it up. You don't have to set up a, a schema. You don't have to think about how you're going to save your data. You just put it in, get it out, whatever. Um, and another uh, consequence is consequences, um, that it's extremely um, practical. Um, and you can change it whenever you want, and uh, your logic schema uh, is then e uh, exactly the same as your database schema. Uh, and it's all, that means that there's no more impedance mismatch problem. Uh, so as the NoSQL movement became more prominent and people ta talked about it more frequently and the programming community accepted this as uh, an interesting solution, um, different relational database companies decided that this is the time for them to redesign parts of their uh, database design. And one such feature was added by uh, Postgres uh, when they uh, created a new data type called JSON. Uh, now, JSON, now Postgres created um, two new data types, JSON and JSONB. The first one, JSON, was created already and was um, pu given public already with, an, with, the, with the version 9.2, which was in September 2012, which is a long time ago if you think about it. Um, but its only functionality was that uh, everything that it did was it just checked whether the data entered was really of a JSON type. Uh, and it didn't do anything else. Uh, now, two years later, uh, with 9.4, uh, what they did was introduce a new data type called JSONB. Uh, now, this was a big revolution because with it came querying and indexing of the data inside the JSON. That meant that uh, Postgres was treating the JSON as a small data structure. Um, and you can query it just like, an, just like you would any other column in the database. Um, now, what, uh, what we liked about this um, 
uh, this uh, new data type was particularly that, that you can query it. Before the JSON, we did have, uh, we did sometimes store a JSON in the database, but it was just as normal, te normal text, and it was more for a logging or as a form of insurance. For instance, we did uh, often s uh, save the data from a um, submitted form. As you have a website, you have se several forms on this website, and when you, uh, a user uh, enters the data and submits it, it's usually emailed to somebody. But often it turns out that this somebody doesn't really exist, or this somebody never reads their emails, or this somebody uh, doesn't have the mail server configured correctly. Uh, so for us, that was just a way of uh, saving every form um, uh, submitted so that if in two months somebody figures out that they haven't checked their emails, they can still see uh, what, the, what the questions from their customers were. Um, but once JSON was an option, um, we were very intrigued about it because first, it is in enormously flexible. Uh, there are some problems where you need flexibility, where you don't want to define what exactly is going to be in the database and you don't want to change it every time you change the schema. So that was a great um, uh, plus for us. And the other one is that the data inside the JSON is completely equal to any other columns. Um, and the first big project that I used uh, the JSON data types on was our shop. Now, if you imagine a shop, the most important part in a shop is when you go from uh, a cart to the payment. So once a customer decides, okay, these are the products I want to buy, uh, they, and they click pay, uh, they need to have uh, an immutable uh, class or, or object. Uh, this data is never allowed to be changed after the moment they click uh, pay. Uh, even if uh, they ta it takes them three hours to put in the uh, credit card uh, data because they have to pay for exactly the data that they have seen the last moment they saw the card. And this created a problem um, which, I, which we solved by transforming a card object into a payment request object. But these two objects are practically the same. Uh, they just have one uh, significant difference. Um, the, um, uh, the card object uh, holds references to products whereas the payment request object holds actual data about the product. You can't reference uh, a product because it might change its price or its name or its availability or whatever. You need to have exactly the data. And that meant that inside uh, this uh, payment request, we have, um, uh, we have the same columns as inside the cart and the same columns as inside the product. And that's just wrong. It can't be that we have to constantly duplicate everything uh, to make it work. Um, by doing this, uh, first of all, well, um, we'd be violating so many design uh, guidelines. You should never duplicate code. And anyway, if you change, if you add some functionality on one part, you shouldn't have to change the same thing somewhere else in the code. Um, so that was a big problem. Uh, and that is why we decided that to look at, at least look at the JSON the data type. Because to me, it felt a bit counterintuitive to just put all your data into a sack and put it into, the, into one value and then be done with it. It kind of seemed as this could be a problem uh, longer down the line. Uh, maybe it becomes a disaster area in two years. And anyway, what if in, I don't know, six months, we add a new feature to the product? What, do we then have to uh, add the same feature to the payment request uh, because it holds all the data? And maybe I won't be doing that change, maybe somebody else will, so I have to uh, inform that other person uh, that maybe they will have to also change the payment request just because they changed the product. Um, and that all seemed counterintuitive. Um, so I made a pros and cons list and it just so turned out that the pro list was really strong and JSON is a really powerful and a practical tool. Um, so what I did then is I took my payment request object which is the first example, and uh, the payment request is like the order. An, an order that the person makes, and the payment request entries are the products that the person buys. Uh, and I just somewhat uh, unwillingly changed a few fields, so that, so that I added a few JSON data types. And now another thing I should say that the JSON and the JSONB um, data types um, are a bit similar, a bit uh, different in Postgre, because JSON stores the, an exact copy of the data, which means any space, any new line, everything is stored. Um, 
also if there are any duplicate uh, key values, everything is stored. Um, whereas uh, in the JSONB data type, uh, you get a decomposed binary format, which means that um, if there are any duplicates, the last value is kept. Uh, the order of keys is also not kept, uh, and uh, no insignificant white space is kept. If at all possible, you should always use the JSONB, but sometimes um, you need uh, the order of keys, for instance, preserved, and for those instances, you can use the JSON data type. Um, Okay, let's look at the shop product JSON, which holds the data about the product inside uh, the bot uh, order. So each time a new um, payment request item is created, I simply uh, collect all the data rele uh, relevant to the product and I put it into an array and I put it into the database, just like that. Uh, and the array does need to be one dimensional, as you can see in the promotion example. Um, even the promotions data is collected and put together with the other product data. And now when we, the next step is to turn this into a JSON and insert it into the um, database. Uh, as you can see uh, in the left, uh, on the, on the uh, opposite of top, bottom, bottom? As you can see in the bottom, uh, JSON checks for the, for the validity of, uh, uh, of the JSON, uh, PostgreSQL checks for the validity of the JSON because obviously if it wants to treat the JSON as a, little data structure, it needs to be sure that it's in the right format. Um, and when you get it out of the database, it looks like this. Now there are a few things that are interesting here. The first thing is that uh, the keys are in a different order. As I said, that it's something that JSONB does, but it's something that nobody really notices. I didn't notice it for many months because why do I care if it's the school or the title, whatever is the first and the second? The time when I did notice it is when we used um, a plugin that was turning JSONs into forms. You would just create a JSON, uh, say, OK, we'll have one name field, one email field, one um, address field, and the, the, a plugin, um, an Angular plugin, would transform it into a form. And now, obviously, on the test, I used just two fields. And obviously, as it turned out, these two fields came out in the same order as I put them in, just by random, by chance. And I didn't quite uh, see what the problem was. But then later on, as, we, as I tested with production-like uh, um, forms, which had groupings and um, complicated fields, then I saw that all the fields are strangely reordered. Uh, and then came the big hunt. OK, I did something wrong. No, it was not my code. OK, OK, then the framework did something wrong. No, the framework didn't do anything wrong. OK, then it's PHP doesn't know how to transform array, uh, an array to JSON. But no, even that was not the problem. And I said, could it really be the database? That can't be. Why would the database change keys? And I think, OK, how can I Google that? How can I even Google? Does postgrad change JSON values, blah, blah? And yes, it turned out that was the first result that JSON does exactly that. <laughs> it changes, it reorders everything, which was in the, in the small text somewhere at the bottom of the, of the page. So that's how we learned that part. OK, so uh, the big question is, how do we query? So at the beginning, what we needed to do was take the JSON out of the database, the, uh, um, turn it into an array or an object and see what data it has. But now because of Postgre, because it's treating the JSON as a, a little data structure, <laughs> we don't need this step anymore of the decoding. It's already decoded inside the database, which means that querying is really, really, really simple, like this. As you can see in this select statement, you can together in one select statement, get the ID and the whole price and the number of items, which are regular columns, together with the SKU, the title, and the price with text, which are stored inside the JSON. And uh, the result is a simple um, table as, as you're used to. Uh, and this, I think, is just perfect. I mean, this, this opens up so many possibilities. Just imagine not having to uh, define the database structure for everything. Mm, I think this could be, this could make our lives very simple. This could be the get the best of both worlds scenario. Uh, relational database are, ba databases are great and anyway we need the relation, relation part of relational databases. We like the, the possibility of having the user data stored in one place but then referencing the same user everywhere. 
Um, and anyway, most data is simple. Relational databases have no problem storing most of the data. There's just that sometimes we have these projects where um, they're too complicated, they're too f they, they call for too much flexibility. And just turning these same uh, projects into uh, relational databases where you have just one table, one row inside, the, uh, inside tables, it just brings too, mu too much too many problems, it brings too many limitations, and it means too much maintenance. And this could really uh, transform the way uh, we, we treat data, and could really transform the way you treat new projects from uh, now on. Uh, okay, so how to create details? Uh, there are about uh, four plus eight or nine uh, different uh, operators, but in fact there are just five, because all the others are just variations to the team. Uh, now there are four basic um, operators, um, and then there are eight more which are from JSON-B. Uh, interesting part is the J you, you, can't, um, you can't index the JSON field, you can only index the uh, JSON-B field. So let's get first to the basic uh, operators. Um, the f this, one, this one is the basic basic. This one is really the, the utmost basic operator there is. Um, you can run it on arrays, as uh, illustrated in the left examples, or on objects, as illustrated on the right. If you run it on, uh, on arrays, you give it an integer, which represents the number, the index of the item, and it returns whatever item it finds, as a JSON. That's very important. What it returns is always a JSON. Um, even an empty JSON, as you can see in the last example. Uh, the same is true for objects. If you're running an, uh, it on objects, you, you obviously can't give it an index. You have to give it the name of the key. Uh, and you have to give it a string. And then it returns whatever it finds uh, on that uh, uh, as a value. It can be a simple number, but given as JSON, or a whole JSON. Uh, now, a variation to the previous operator uh, is this one. Uh, the difference is that this one returns text. And now that's extremely important because text can be cast to an integer or float or whatever, whereas a JSON can, can only be cast to text. Um, as you can see, uh -huh, there's a mistake. Uh, okay, as you can see uh, on the left side, uh, you again give it uh, an integer and it returns data as text. But in the second example, there should be only one uh, arrow, one, not two arrows, uh, because uh, the select statement should return um, a JSON, and a JSON cannot be compared to an integer. Um, oh no, actually it's perfectly fine, because even if it's text, even text can't be compared to an integer. Um, if it was just one arrow, it'd be JSON, and a JSON can't be bigger than one and can't be smaller than one. But even if it's two arrows, it's still text, and even text can't be bigger or smaller than one. So it's still an error. But on the right, you can see that this can st must still ha uh, has to be cast to an integer, and after that, yes, then it can be compared. Uh, and in the last example, you can see that if you just take the one arrow example uh, and you cast it into to the int, uh, you receive an error because uh, a JSON would need to be first cast to text and then to int, but even that wouldn't give you the result we'd want. Okay, so the next operator, uh, oh, this is the same operator but on, um, on objects. It works the same way, uh, but without the, the, the casting to text, because text is already text, there's no need to cast it. Uh, and in the right, you can see how these two, the first and the second um, operators, are meant to be used. Um, first, you get the sub-JSONs, which are items, and zero, the, first, uh, uh, the, the object on the first uh, key uh, index, and then you, get, then you use the double arrow operator, which gives you text. Uh, and in this case, it's one, two, three um, uh, levels deep, uh, so you can get any kind of data out of the JSON. Okay, now uh, these are same, again, different operators, uh, but they are actually the same. Um, you just have to uh, give the path um, in this format on the right and not uh, in the format on the left. Instead of, specify, instead of, instead of creating how the path will uh, go, first this, then that, and that, you just uh, describe how the path will, uh, will lead, and uh, um, it's used for when, when you have data in the right format, so you don't have to transform it into the left. Okay, the next one are these two operators. Um, these two operators return a Boolean, and that means uh, they are really great for search, and that means they are meant to be used as, for indexing. 
um, when you when you have a JSON indexed, uh, what you want to use is the first operator here, uh, because if you use the, the, the previous ones. Um, Postgre won't use the indexing. It will still make a sequential scan. Um, so the first operator, it checks whether the JSON on the left uh, contains the JSON on the right. The important part is that it does this at top level. You can't say it, you, you can't say just give me all the rows which have this uh, JSON anywhere inside their data. You have to specify the whole path from the top level to, the, uh, to every v value that you want to check. Um, the second operator checks whether uh, the entered um, whether the entered um, key exists or not. Um, but this time you can't specify a path. You have to say uh, if to, to see whether I don't know uh, this code exists inside promotion, which is one level deep. You first have to get out the promotion with the first uh, operator and then s uh, ask it whether uh, it has um, this key. Okay. Um, this is, an, uh, this is um, uh, an actual example. The first one sees just the number of, uh, the number of products uh, this promotion code was, has been used on. And the second one, um, as you can see, you can uh, use aware um, with, the, with the last operator that we, that we discussed and see all the payment requests that had this, uh, this promotion inside. Um, or, or this, you can even group by. Um, something, some value inside the uh, inside the JSON. This time we're grouping to see how many products have been bought uh, for by this for this promotion in different countries. Uh, and even you can even do joins. You can even uh, join two tables according to uh, some value inside the um, uh, inside the JSON. And this is, for instance, uh, how you, how to to see the history of for what price has this specific product been bought uh, through history. Um, and then about the indexing, there are three different indexes. There's the basic one, which indexes every key and every value. And then there's the smaller one, which indexes only every value. Which means if you have a key that doesn't have a value, you, can't, uh, you won't get a return. You can't check whether that key exists, because if it doesn't have a value, it's not in the index. And the third option is, uh, you can index just one key if you know that I'm always o only always going to search by the promotion code. Then you just say, just index me the promotion code. And this is an actual an example. I had a three million uh, row table, um, and the first, um, uh, the biggest index is ten uh, megabytes. The the smaller one is about twenty percent smaller. And if I index just by the uh, by one column, I get a seventy percent uh, smaller index. Uh, sometimes this is relevant, most of the time it's not. So most of the time, just uh, saying that the whole JSON is indexed is um, good enough for us. Um, okay, what we've used data, data, the uh, JSON data type for? We've used it in the shop. We've used it in the change log. This is, this is a list of, um, of changes that have been made to an object or to a process or to whatever. We just say, this has been changed. These are the data about the change. This has been changed. These are the data. So we can query uh, directly inside the database. Um, we've then done this, which I said, turning a JSON form, a form into a JSON into a form. Um, and we've done this. This is extremely flexible. As you can see, um, this is creating an event. Uh, you say, it's a, is it a daily event? Is it a monthly event? Is it a weekly event? Now, I could uh, define all the columns, but that's kind of hard. So it's much easier to just say, this is the, the way, uh, um, this is a JSON, and just uh, define the format inside the code, document it, very good, that's very important, and then just show it. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Out of time.